wrong one there. Lesson 34 here. Genesis chapter 40. Where we want to make sure we are. Looks like everyone's there. That's good. So Joseph interprets dreams. He was at a high point probably in his life, enjoying life at home. His father, we saw a low point when he was sold to the Ishmaelites and sold in Egypt. And then his life began to, in his mind, probably look up and improve in the house of Potiphar. And then it begins to take a low point again when he's in prison. But we talked about last time how, again, Joseph, being that good example, he began to uh, climb back up and become a well-respected man in the prison. So chapter 40, we're going to see how uh, these years in prison, some situations that he came across that God was already preparing so that it was a, a way for Joseph to be taken out of prison and put into the high position he would need to be for God to have his people come to Egypt and grow there. So chapter 40, let's start at verse 1 there. And it came to pass after these things that the butler of that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker had offended their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was wroth against two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers and against the chief of the bakers. And he put them inward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them and he served them. And they continued a season inward. The butler, what does he do for the king? What are some of his tasks or duties? Amber. Okay, prepares the drinks. Probably does lots of small tasks for the king to make sure things are set up nicely when he comes into his throne room, it's cleaned off, and everybody's in their spot. The butler has those things. But one of the main things is to bring the cup of wine. Okay? What else might the butler have to do with that wine? Brody? Taste it because the king might be concerned that someone might have done what to the wine, Joe? Poisoned it. Okay? So he's upset with the, with the uh, butler. We don't know why here. And he's also upset with the chief baker. I think that's a little bit more easy to understand. What does the baker do? Jaden? Breads and cakes, right? Things that need to be baked in the oven. Okay, those types of items. So these two men had in some way made the king happy. Maybe one of them planned to kill the king. Maybe one of them attempted to do something. We don't know. We don't know if they're guilty or whether they're not. But anyways, this is the king's prison, and this is where the, that's why Joseph is here, because Potiphar would be a, an important man in the court of the king, so he had access to putting Joseph here. So these men are brought in, like we said before, this prison might be a place for the king to set some people temporarily so that he could maybe teach them a lesson or learn some things or figure some things out. But anyways, uh, they're brought into the prison, and Joseph is put over top of them. He is to be their ruler, okay? And they continued a season inward. So for some time, they were in this prison. Okay, we don't know how long, doesn't tell, but for a season. So it probably is a, a decent amount of time. Verse 5. And they dreamed a dream, both of them, each man in his dream one night, each man according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in prison. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning. And they looked upon him, and behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the, war, in the ward of the Lord, his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore, look ye so, sad today, so sadly today. And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me them, I pray you. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph, and said to him, In a dream, behold, a vine was before me, and, the vine, and in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded. And her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days, 
Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee unto thy place, and thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast his butler. But think on me, so he's saying, remember me, when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me, and make mention of me unto Pharaoh, and bring me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of the Hebrews, and here also have I done nothing that they should put me in this dungeon. So kind of telling him, don't forget about me, remember me when you get out. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said unto Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head. And the uppermost basket there was all manner of bake, bake meats for Pharaoh, and the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. And Joseph answered and said, This is the interpretation thereof. The three baskets are three days. Yet within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head from off thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat thy flesh from off thee. And it came to pass the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast unto all his servants, and he lifted up the head of the chief butler, and of the chief baker among his servants, and he restored the chief butler unto his butlership again, and he gave the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. So, I think you're for well familiar with this story. Those two men, one day have a sad face. Joseph knows something's wrong, something's bothering him. You all can see that. You can recognize that on the face of mom and dad when maybe something's bothering them or going wrong at the home or a brother or sister is upset with something. So Joseph very easily could see the face of the butler and baker that they were upset about something. And so he asked them, well, what is this about? What's bothering you? And they said, well, we've had a dream last night. And the problem is here in prison there's not interpreters. You see, in Pharaoh's house they were, in, they were used to having all of these magicians and philosophers, men who looked at the stars. He had all of those men in the house who could tell them and, well, try to tell them the interpretation dreams, give them some meaning to them. And, of course, they believed in all that hocus-pocus foolishness, okay? all those horoscopes and looking into the future. Here they're disappointed. There's no one that can tell them what they mean. Joseph, being the godly young man that he is, tells them, well, I can tell you the interpretation of those dreams because they are dreams from God, and God will reveal them to me. It is of God to know the interpretations of dreams, not to those soothsayers and magicians. What else? All right. So the butler says, well, what did the butler see in his dream? What did he see? Jaden? Um, a vine, and on the vine branches. Okay. And what did he do with the grapes that were on those branches? What did the butler do with them? Jennifer? Okay, then the Pharaoh. What was the interpretation, did Joseph say then? What was the meaning of that dream? Micah? Three branches for three days, and, the, and Pharaoh would bless the three branches again. And make him butler again, right? Yeah, those three branches are a picture of three days. Three days from now, Pharaoh will call you out of the dungeon, and he will restore you back to your butlership again, and you will be butler. And then Joseph says, and by the way, when you are taken out, please talk to Pharaoh for me. Tell him how I'm here unjustly. I was stolen out of my land. I was taken here. I was wrongfully accused and put into this prison. Please let him know, and maybe he'll hear me, and I can get out. So that's the butler. Now what about the baker? What did the baker see in his dream? Colin? He saw, well, he had three white baskets on his head. Yep. Well, what happened to those, what was in the baskets on his head? So he had three baskets on his head, that's true. What happened to the baskets on his head? Sydney? He had baked meats on the top, top one, and, and the birds ate them out of the basket on the bottom. All right. In those baskets were things that the baker had prepared, food. And before he could get to Pharaoh to give those, give that food to him, the birds came and began to peck away and eat at that. He never got to get them to Pharaoh. Therefore, the interpretation of the dream is that in three days, the three baskets are three days, you also will be taken out of prison by Pharaoh, but you will be hanged on a tree. And while you're there, those birds eating the baked meats are a picture of the birds eating your body. Okay? And what Joseph said then came true. In three days, it was Pharaoh's birthday. He had a large party. He probably remembered the butler, oh yes, I'd like to have him back doing his job again. 
He took him out, restored him to his butlership. The baker, maybe he didn't. Maybe there was something that he had found out that the baker had done wrong. Maybe the baker hadn't done anything wrong. We don't know. But he was killed. He was hanged on a tree. And obviously the birds would have come and eaten his flesh. So, Joseph here properly interprets the dreams, but he is still in prison and that butler forgot him. So that's where chapter 41 comes in because now God is going to send some dreams to Pharaoh, but the knowledge of the bait butler will finally come into play here. So verse 40, or chapter 41, verse 1, And it came to pass at the end of two full years that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kind and fat-fleshed, and they fed any meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kind upon the brink of the river. What are kind, by the way, so we're understanding, Micah? Okay. And the ill-favored and lean-fleshed kind did eat up the seven well-flavored and fat kind, so Pharaoh awoke. So and that's the end of his first dream. And he slept and dreamed the second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears... And blasted with the east one sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. So there we have the two dreams. What number is in there? What's the number we need to pay attention to? Brody? Seven. seven okay? The idea of seven there. And in each situation, both the cows and in the corn, which ones came first, the bad or the good ones? Colin? The good fat cows came first, and the good fat ears of corn, and then came the poor ones, and they ate up or devoured the other ones. All right, so Pharaoh wakes from his dream, and now he's wondering what they, what they mean. Verse 8, And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt, and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. So they couldn't help him out. Then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. So he says, I was wrong. I made a mistake. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants, in other words, me and the baker, and put me inward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night, I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, a Hebrew servant to the captain of the guard. And we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man according to his dream did he interpret. It came to pass, as he interpreted to us, so it was. Me he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged. So the butler basically says to Pharaoh, Hey, when I was in prison, there was this young Hebrew man there. He was a leader, and he very easily told me what was going on. He, he, he perfectly told us the interpretations of our dreams, and what he told us would happen, those things happened exactly. That is what happened. Okay, so Pharaoh, obviously that would pique his interest. What would Pharaoh do then? If he found out that there's some man that in the prison that can interpret dreams that he thinks has special powers. Amber? Let's see what happens. Verse 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon. And he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I have dreamed a dream, and there is none that can interpret it. And I have heard say of thee that thou canst interpret a dream, understand a dream to interpret it. And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me, God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, In my dream, behold, I stood upon the bank of the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven kind, fat flesh, and well favored, and they fed in the meadow, and behold, seven other kind came up after them, poor and very ill favored and lean fleshed, such as I have never seen in all the land of Egypt for badness. And the lean and ill favored kind did eat up the first fat seven kind, and when they had eaten them up, it could not be known that they had eaten them. In other words, they did get fatter. Hey, those thin cows should have all of a sudden ballooned up when they ate them, but they didn't. But they were still ill-favored as at the beginning, so I awoke. And I saw in my dream, and behold, seven ears came up in one stalk, full and good. And behold, seven ears withered, thin and blasted with the east one, sprung up after them. And the thin ears devoured the seven good ears. And I told this unto the magicians, but there was none that could declare it to me. So Pharaoh here tells, again, the dreams. We see a little bit more information. Okay? We see that Pharaoh says, these thin cows were so thin, so skinny. I've never seen a cow in the land of Egypt, and the richness of her land, that is that skinny. But it was in Egypt, in my dream, that's got him worried. He also gave us the information that when those cows, the thin ones, ate the fat ones, they didn't increase in their size. There was nothing that was gained for them. Okay? 
Joseph, we see, wisely answers Pharaoh and again says, Look, I told the butler an interpretation of a dream, and I know you think I can do all kinds of magical, wonderful things, but that's not what's the case. It is God that's the interpreter of dreams. He told me. So you make sure that's very clear, and that's good of Joseph to do here. Verse 25, And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, The dream of Pharaoh is one. God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good kind are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dream is one. And this, so he's saying both the two separate dreams that you had, they mean the same thing. Okay? And the seven thin and ill-favored kind that came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blasted with the east wind shall be seven years of famine. This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Behold, there come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt, and there shall arise after them seven years of famine. And all the plenty shall be forgotten in the land of Egypt, and the famine shall consume the land. And the plenty shall not be known in the land by reason of the famine of that famine following, for it shall be very grievous. And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now therefore let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise, and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this. And let him appoint officers over the land, and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years. And let them gather all the food of those good years that come, and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh, and let them keep food in their cities. And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt, that the land perish not through the famine. So here's the wisdom of Joseph, passing along to Pharaoh, what things should be done. Okay? Tells him, look, those seven fat cows and those seven fat ears, those are the next seven years. God is going to richly bless the land of Egypt. You are going to have bountiful harvests. You are going to bring in way more than what you need. But after that are going to come seven more years of famine in which you're going to have hardly nothing. In fact, there's going to be so little that all of the goodness that you saved up in those seven good years is going to be completely swallowed up and by the end of those seven bad years, you're going to have nothing. Okay? And we'll see how that even is more different than that idea. Sometimes that's the idea that we think, but it's even worse. The famine was even worse than that. And the people probably had some other issues in there too that we'll talk about with the next lesson. But that is the interpretation of the dream. And then Joseph goes on and gives to Pharaoh more wisdom. He says, look, what you need to do is to begin planning. You need to go ahead and start saving up require of everyone to give a fifth of their harvest, and they have to bring that. Usually we think of tithing, we think of bringing a tenth to God. These guys are bringing double that. They're going to be bringing a fifth of all of their fields, of all of their harvest is going to be brought to Pharaoh. Pharaoh's going to build, should build storehouses to keep them in, okay? And he should have leaders over the different places of the land and bring those things to him so that they can be stored up for the years of famine. You will have food ready to go and plenty, okay? So, elect some men and do that. Well, Joseph, obviously with his words of wisdom, his personality, who he is, the king can see, just like, uh, just like Potiphar and just like the chief jailer, could see in Joseph that he was a good man. He sees he's a godly man, but he was a good man. And so, when Pharaoh... Seeing Joseph in all his wisdom, more wisdom than his interpreters, because again, Pharaoh is an ungodly man and sees for the, uh, the interpreters as wise men, and if this man is even wiser, well, here he has before him the perfect candidate for the job. Joseph is kind of the man of the hour here, and Pharaoh says, well, I want you to be my leader. I want you to do that work. Let's see how that goes. Verse 37, and the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, Bow the knee! And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name 
Zaphnath Paenia, and he gave him to wife Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of An, and Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. And in the seven plenteous years, the earth brought forth by handfuls. And he gathered up all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt and laid up the food in the cities and the food of the field which was round about every city laid he up the same. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering for it was without number. And unto Joseph were born two sons, which came before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, the priest of An, bare him. Okay. Uh, and Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said he hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called the Ephraim, for God had caused him to be fruitful in the land of his affliction. And the seven years of plenteousness that was in the land of Egypt were ended. And the seven years of dearth began to come according as Joseph had said. And the dearth was in all lands, but in the land of Egypt there was bread. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to do, do. And the famine was over all the face of the earth. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold unto the Egyptians. And the famine waxed sore in the land of Egypt. And all countries came into Egypt to Joseph for to buy corn, because that famine was, in, was so sore in all the lands. I read a little bit of what we're going to read tomorrow again, but it's the idea there. You want, I want to bring some finality to the idea here. So Joseph is made into that ruler. He is made into that high position. He took off the ring from Pharaoh's own hand and is put on Joseph's hand. He's put in fine vestures. So he has nice clothing, the clothing of kings. A gold chain is placed about his neck. He's made to ride in the second chariot, which he had, so only Pharaoh is higher than him. All the people were told to bow down to him, and Joseph was in charge of building these storehouses and bringing in the food from the different places, so much so that the corn was as much as the sand of the sea. He couldn't even count it anymore. You can see God was richly blessing here. If we go back to our story about Isaac, we see that when he was in the land of the Philistines with Abimelech, there was a famine in the land, and the men would bring forth, or with Isaac, he brought forth a hundredfold. God richly blessed him there. He did a miracle. He gave him a hundred times more than what he should. We can say God's doing the same here. He is giving much to the people of Egypt because God is doing that to prepare a way to bring his people down to Egypt in the future. So Joseph is the ruler. He's giving a new life. Okay, we also see, we'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow. He's given a wife. He has two sons. But the idea is he is here preparing for this great famine that will come. He has seven years to save up. At the end of the seven years, the end of it. All of a sudden, a great famine comes. Okay? So, you guys did a good job looking over your worksheets on answering most of those questions there. Okay? So that was good. So we'll see tomorrow how those things continue to advance. But if there's one thing we can, again, take from Joseph's life here, he was content in prison. We don't see him whining and complaining. Yes, he does ask the butler to remember him. Nothing wrong with that. But he always gives the credit to God. Sometimes we go, hey, that was a nice job you guys did doing that. Or maybe someone comes up after a Christmas program or something. Hey, I really enjoyed your... Well, thank you, tell them. But I could only do it because God enabled me to do it. That's what our answer should be. We always need to remember that too. If we can... Take something from Joseph today, it's that, that we give the glory and the honor and the credit for the good things that happen in our lives to God, not to our own selves.